Greetings, everyone. This is Payman Lorenzo, your host, your friend, your coach of the Leader Without Podcast. Today, tonight, this morning, this afternoon, wherever in the world, this beautiful planet you may be, I'm talking with another wonderful new friend of mine, Karen from Perth, Australia. We get connected to uh, one of my best friends, my uh, one of my alumni of my uh, three-week launcher podcast channel, as well as now my publisher, Mary Gooden. And we both have that in common because Karen was also part of uh, Mary's, uh, uh, one of her multi-authored book, which was released last December called All Hearted Entrepreneurs. So from one fellow number one international seller to another, that's awesome. So uh, there's so many, so much more that we can talk. We had a wonderful chat about a week ago. And as soon as we started talking, I said, listen, I need to, to bring you on a podcast to share your story because you have a powerful story. And my podcast is all about sharing powerful stories. So just a little bit about her. There's so much more. I don't want to uh, to butcher it, but she will say it, she will say it better. But just to summarize it, she's currently she's she's living in Australia in Perth originally. From uh, uh, she has a mix of Italian and Peruvian from beautiful Peru, uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, what she's doing, she's um, she's uh, helping women to um, to find their voice, their authentic voice, get greater visibility through speaking and mindset. For the past two years, she spent uh, the bulk of her time, you know, investing in herself. She got uh, certified, qualified as a coach, as a public speaker. Uh, and also um, she got qualified in NLP, ethnotherapy, and a, 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 lot, a lot more things to say, but she will say it. And uh, another thing that is uh, worth mentioning is that she had uh, one of those curveballs thrown at her by life. Back in 2020, she was um, diagnosed with cancer. We can do an entire podcast, even an entire book just on that. <laughs> uh, um, and, and, and we'll see. And so much more we can talk, but uh, yeah. So I think I'm going to stop uh, rambling now. Just say, hey, listen, Karen, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you so much, Payman. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful to connect. Uh, like you said, we met because of uh, our common friend, Mary Gooden. She's an amazing human being and a, uh, a publisher that I, I was delighted to work with. Uh, you mentioned, yeah, wholehearted leaders. So this is my first um, my first step into authoring. And um, of course, it's a multi-author. I share part of my story in a chapter of that book. Um, but it's, it was a wonderful experience. And I heard you, I think, in an interview in, in her group, and that's sort of how we connected. So uh, straight away, very much aligned because you, you're you talking about helping people's voices be heard. And, and that's obviously very much in line with my, my mission. And um, yes, yeah, so I just wanted to say I'm, I'm Karen O'Connor. I, I branded myself as transformational speaking coach because I feel that there's so many speaking coaches and so many ways that you can do public speaking. But for me, the ability to speak from the heart with confidence, to share your story, to, to really connect with people is beyond just the strategies to stand up and command the stage and speak in a certain way. So that's what I thought the mindset comes in and the, the, the working together to kind of like dive deep. How can you speak authentically if you don't know what your authentic self, what that is, you know? So finding those diamonds in your life, in your story, um, and just help sort of polish it a little bit so that you can bring them to light. And I think um, everybody has a story that can help um, oh. inspire somebody or bring some hope or, um, you know, just be there for someone else. And it can be a healing journey. So that's something that I'm very, very passionate about. Beautiful. So thank you for having me. <laughs> we have a lot to talk about. We can do a few podcasts together. So I'm looking forward to it. But let's start first with this one. So as I told you last time when we spoke, the types of conversation I like to have is to look under the hood, so to speak, to see what's in your heart, to have a heart chat conversation, hence the name, Leader with a Heart. Because what I want to yes. know, what my audience wants to know is, who is the person as a human being, first and foremost, before the uh, the title? So we're going to talk about your business, your achievements later on. But first and yes. foremost, people who don't know you, tell us, who's Karen as a human being? Who? That's a, it's a very, very interesting question. It's just, I feel one of the main things is, um, I think, as you mentioned, I, I was born in Peru. Actually, I grew up in Peru. I came to Australia in my early 20s. 
my mother and her family um, are all Italians. My 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 mum and, and her oldest brother were born in Italy in the war and then they came to Peru. So out of all my cousins, one married a Brazilian, the other one married a German. We had Italians, we had Peruvians. So I was always in a very, very multicultural environment, even at home. So that's something that I think without me realizing had an impact on me because I've always loved traveling and connecting with people uh, and I love diversity so when I've traveled through the world um, to me somebody made that sort of subtle difference you know you're not a you can be a tourist or you can be a traveler the yeah. tourist goes and just wants to see the museums and the you know the touristy things and and for me it was always about well, what can we find out, you know, taking the local train, always learning a few words in the local language. And, and that is just such a wonderful experience. And it just brings to me, it's, it really fills my heart. So that is a big part of me. And I've always loved talking. Now, that's something that naturally comes to me and what I've learned um, from coaching and all the things that I'm doing now and, and working now in my business is, how can you do that without the ego, right? Because you gotta you gotta talk, but you also gotta listen. And now I'm connecting with so many wonderful people from around the world that it, it's so enriching because, like you say, you have these powerful conversations. So yes, you can be giving your opinion, but you're also learning and getting and growing so much. So it's just a beautiful, um, it's just a beautiful interaction. So for me, it's always been speaking traveling connecting and I love nature and which is probably why even though I came to Australia with my then husband we both came from Peru um, when we split up he decided to to go back and I decided to stay even though it was a tough decision because I decided to stay on my own uh, my family is all still in Peru so I loved the place and I also I think took it as that being part of my journey of self-discovery as well and trying to, to figure things out from when I started at 29 because he'd been my first love and my boyfriend from high school and that. So it's just kind of like it was a wonderful experience. Then we had some difficult challenges, but then, you know, you get to start looking, okay, well, who am I in all of this? And, um, yeah, so... Definitely, everything happens for a reason. At the right time, absolutely. At the right time, yes. All people know, but uh, let's, uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. But now, I'd like to ask you a series of rapid fire questions to further get to know you. Ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, go for it. All right. What makes you happy? Ooh, I love nature. Yeah, super inspiring. What makes you smile? very easy <laughs> I think connection just yeah just feeling that that um connecting to other people yeah well, now let's take the happiness uh, you know a couple of notches even higher what makes your heart come alive what what sets your soul on fire in a good way Ooh. I think when I'm passionate about something and I meet somebody that we can just kind of like share the same the same energy and just kind of like escalates because you keep talking and growing and inspiring and it's like let's make it happen <laughs> oh. now on the other side of the spectrum what makes you sad and angry mm. uh i've lots, learned a lot to try not to feel angry uh but uh, you know obviously uh, against wrong wrongdoing I suppose wrong things, you know, people doing the wrong things and and, and harming whether it's others or the environment or nature. Um, yeah, that's certainly not um, not a good place. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. What makes you sorry? What scares you? Hmm. Other than spiders and, and snakes. Not really. I, I get spiders here. Um, I think it's more than scaring is it's fear. And uh, I think it's, if I'm going to be totally honest, is the fear of failing, which sometimes can keep us stuck. 
So I, I recognize that in myself, you know, and, and it's just something that I'm constantly working on. Okay. What would you say is your number one personal superpower? Hmm. I think I, when I meet a kindred spirit, I connect with the heart. Like I really, I feel that energy and, and the women that I've worked with, um, they tell me sort of that sort of nurturing and really caring. And I really believe in the fact that you can do it. And I believe in you, which, you know, it's, it's a supportive, caring, um, I think, nature. That's, yeah. Beautiful. Now, let's talk about something you both, you both love. You love traveling, right? Yes. <laughs> what was your very first trip? Ooh, um, I traveled a little bit within Peru, but my very first big trip would have been we, when I got married at 19, actually my, my husband and I decided, he was a surfer, he was a bit crazy too. Um, wow. We uh, went driving in a v, like a Volkswagen Beetle from Lima all the way to the south of Chile, to the island of Chiloé, literally all through the coast about, I don't know, 1500, 1800 case, maybe not actually more probably, I don't know. Wow. I forgot and they took we took a month yeah it was yeah it was an incredible experience it was a really beautiful place too and not only that would be a book by itself but I wish back then there was you know YouTube and and it was a oh lot yeah of, uh, there was you there was nothing build a powerful following wow hey maybe you can do part two now you know around Australia or even from Peru to Patagonia or whatnot you know that yeah I um I, um, I think that there's so much that we get to capture. And even now that the technology is there, I, I'm not a good marketer. I forget that. And I, I leave the experience and then I forget, oh, I should have recorded that or I should have taken, you know, occasionally there's a few photos, but um, the, that's a, a really beautiful thing to do now if you're traveling. Yes, I totally agree. Now, let me take you down a different type of traveling, down memory line. Go back to when you mm. were growing up. You know, when we're kids, people around us, family, parents, teachers, relatives, always ask us, parent, what do you want to become when you grow up? What was your answer as a young girl to that question? That's a good question because for me, it was never clear. So I'm very I'm a very practical person. So I, and I had all my my soul searching and finding myself, uh, which is why I sometimes say uh, I can help people find their purpose now because that was me. So I, I kind of like look back and I say, well, I can envy those that I always wanted to be a ballerina or I always loved to sing. Or, and, and to me, it was nothing special. And when I finished um, high school, I was, I was um, incidentally enough, you know, I had good grades. I wasn't the best student, but I was saying in the top 10, I could have gone to university and, but I had already had a boyfriend. And so for me, there was nothing to say, okay, it warrants four years of study. So what is the most practical thing that I can do that I can, that I can actually have then freedom. And so I started to be a secretary, 12 months, bilingual secretary, I could get jobs. And that's something that I could do anywhere in the world, which then helped me because when I came to Australia, I could go to work, like I could start working here directly. So that's that's interesting. And then in in the in the searching things that I've done afterwards, it's okay. Well, I would really sort of see myself speaking on a stage. Beautiful. And then that's something that I think it's been a long journey, but I'm sort of now at, at a stage where that's what I'm doing. Yeah. Well, we'll get there in a moment. So now you mentioned school. What was uh, your favorite subject in school growing up? Oh, interesting. I was always good at the the long answer quizzes. So I love history. Um, I did. I went to a Catholic school. Most of South, South America were Catholic. So um, I did also well with um, religion and the, those. Uh, but history probably and um, and literature some of those things but I, I enjoy those 
take quizzes where I had, I remember I had a group of friends, you know, when you have to kind of like study and give long answers. And I would be before the test explaining to a group of four or five friends, you know, how so they understand they understood those concepts. So it was always not very much the sciences. I was always the what I call it, the, you know, the, the letters, the English, the yeah, English history, uh, those language. Was there any subject that you could not stand at all? No, probably not my ideal. Um, you know the trigonometry and the <laughs> those things and the and the formulas and physics, but um, yeah. yeah, at least I always had passing grades on everything. <laughs> I was a bit similar in that. Me too. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. Now, what was the very first job? My very first job, actually, you did. I skipped something. I skipped something when I was in high school, and I did think that I like to work with kids. I studied briefly to be a childcare worker, I don't know what you call it. Um, so my very first job was like the, pract the practice to, to be in childcare. And then I realized that probably wasn't really for me. So then I studied secretary and my very first job was as a secretary. So um, back in Peru, we don't have like in Australia, I don't know how it's in Canada, they have juniors, like, you know, kids works at McDonald's and, you know, shops like that since they're 14. Um, we don't really do that. You just finish school and then you can go to work. Okay. Now, so what uh, what took you from, what made you leave Peru to come to Australia? Interesting. So I think it was a sense of adventure. And because my, my husband then loved surfing and Oh, he yeah. already studied in the US, so he's already traveled a fair bit. And I like I like that idea. And I remember at that time, because it was in the 80s and there was a lot of turmoil in, in Peru as well. And we were looking at, at going, um, you know, immigrating, and there was visas going for Canada. And then we also had a, a friend that had the brochure for the Australian Bicentenary. And we thought, oh, Canada is beautiful. Uh, called not good for surfing and then we saw the brochure about Australia and the beautiful beaches so, okay let's go for Australia <laughs> right. uh, and, and we ended up so we actually uh, when I first came to Australia I lived in Sydney for about 10 years so I, I only came to Western Australia and Perth now I'm in the southwest uh, a couple of hours from Perth just with my with my husband now who's Australian yeah well, was it easy for you to um to settle in into a completely new continent, new life, new country, new culture, mm -hmm. environment, basically starting from scratch. Yeah, there's always challenges. I think um, something, me personally, I love traveling and I love variety. So from that aspect for me, <clears throat> and I'm not attached to things. So I could leave everything and mm -hmm. move and live somewhere else now too. You know, just leaving the family and friends sometimes that, that's a difficult part, but things yeah. don't matter so much. So some of my friends then said, because I've traveled, I lived in Europe for a year as well when we traveled and um, six yeah. months somewhere else a couple of times. So they've said, oh, you, you're like a gypsy, you know, you find it so easy to, to just pack up and go. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, we live in a van, so... We arrived in Frankfurt and traveled through everywhere and spent three months in Portugal and then came up. And then the second time we flew to the UK and across to France. And so, yeah, so being <clears throat> in a lot of places. Yes, yes. <laughs> Incredible stories, traveling from Peru to the, to the south of Chile and then a year around Europe in, in a van. My God, you have a few amazing books in you. What are you waiting for? <laughs> well, those stories were with my ex, which all that amazing life came with also a dark side towards the end. And uh, it was uh, about time I shared a little bit about that in uh, in Wholehearted Leaders. And that's kind of like what uh, that was, I think, what made the hardest that even though it was so amazing, then I felt that I wasn't able to be myself anymore. Mm. So it's it's yeah it's it's really a a difficult 
I think a difficult situation. But mm -hmm. yeah, so what um, when um, when I came to Australia, just going back to the other side of obviously migrating and, and living in, in other places is it's lonely. You know, it can be very lonely because I didn't come with my family. So it was just the two of us until you make friends. Um, I got my first job. This is a, a very interesting anecdote, if it's right. Yeah. I started, you know, I started at a Bandingwa school. I started English, American English, but, you know, it was English. Um, and then before coming to Australia, I did like a three month intensive at a, at a language institute. And, <clears throat> and over there, the, the teachers were one was British and the other one. So to get a bit more conversational and a bit more up to speed and different accents. I came to Australia. Actually, my ex had a, one friend already here. So he picked us up from the airport, settled us in a hotel, turned the, uh, turned the TV on, to, and it was the news. I'm staring at that, and I go like, oh, my God. I think I was literally picking up one out of three, every three words. So it's like, <laughs> but it's supposed to be English. I wasn't getting anything. And it was the Aussie accent, and it was fast, and it was like, oh, my God. And it's like, how long is it going to take me to get, you know, to understand people? And and of course, the first thing you do, you know, when you arrive in a new place, you do all the paperwork, all the legal documents and whatever. And I started registering with a few just uh, agencies, right, to, to get casual, at, you know, clerical work. And I go, OK, well, I'll do that the next day. And then I get a call. So within the first seven days of arriving and not even understanding the television, I had a job. And it was like, oh, my God, I was freaking out. I was so nervous because, like, what am I going to do if I don't understand them? And it was a financial company. And this is something else for all the migrants who know. When you start in a new country, you start at the bottom, right? Like, I was a bilingual executive secretary in Peru. I worked for, you know, the likes of Castro and Shell and uh, Mac Sharp and Dome and Pfizer. And then I was a filing clerk. <laughs> my very first job in Australia just back in those days you know taking out the staples of the documents and feeding them to the thing to there was not even scanners it was called something else like microfilm or whatever but anyway it was a job the only thing that saved me and I think that was a beautiful time and experience is Sydney was so multicultural in the team of about 12 in that sort of filing department we had a lady from Russia, a lady from India, uh, one from the UK, two from, you know, two from Australia, one from Greece. It was like, oh, my goodness. So, you know, being the Peruvian, it, it was just part of the team. But what really saved me is my boss was from Canada. Oh. So I could understand her. So I got like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so at least I could understand my boss which, you know, when you're working, that's very important. Um, and then what I did is I, I became good friends with um, the other girl from the UK, which actually her name also was Karen. So we hang out and lunchtime and everything and just speaking with her, you know, getting used to the, the British accent, um, it kind of like slowly mm -hmm. I came into that. But yeah, that was, that was really interesting. And it's, it, it you know, knowing all those things that can be daunting and confronting if you go to a country of a different language or something like that and or even different accent <laughs> and then um the the sort of feeling of knowing that when I used to go out um because after that then I, I got a job in this downtown Sydney at a bank then you go out at lunchtime and that except for the handful of people at work which they likely stayed and some of them stayed at lunch in the lunchroom and stuff then you're not likely to meet anyone you know when you're walking down the streets sure. sometimes when I thought about that that was you know it, it was a really lonely place because at home I don't know how it is for you but you go to you know the popular cafe so that and there's always someone right like you bump into somebody and to have that feeling that I knew that that was not going to happen and of course, it didn't happen for six months or whatever it is until you start making some friends, right? Absolutely. So, um, yeah, it's it's challenging, but also exciting. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, absolutely. A couple of questions that came to mind. So mm -hmm. before, were, before coming to Australia, was it? did you share that plan with your family? They were aware of it or you just announced the last minute, hey, mom, dad, I'm going tomorrow on Monday night to Australia or was it something that you were? That you no, no, no. Number one, because we, yeah, so go for it. React when you told them, hey, I'm going to Australia. Ah, that's an interesting, an interesting question. Um, so it was a process because we had to apply for the visa. So it was kind of like a 12 month sort okay. of process. Mm -hmm. So um, mixed feelings because it's, and this is where I think that with my mom, um, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I think because of her background and her personality as well. She always, she always said, as long as you're happy. Mm. And, uh, and this is interesting because I, what ended up happening, which I hadn't planned, is that I came to Australia and about a year later, I actually went back because one of my grandpas had an accident. And so I, I went to see him and he passed away. But then after that, I spent about maybe, I don't know, seven years or something or five years, we hadn't gone back to Peru because we both loved traveling. So we traveled the world. We weren't thinking about going home. And, and for my family, it was very difficult to, to come here either, you know, just financially. So it, we didn't really see each other as much and that, that's something that I perhaps regret it would have been nice to spend more time with them mm -hmm. but I remember having a conversation with my mum and, and um, her saying you know friends would ask her say well how can you you know how can you live like with your daughter so far away but by the way I'm the eldest in my family and uh, and and she tell she said to me you know she used to tell her friends to say because I know she's happy, because she loves it there, right? And, and let's also remember and put things in perspective because nowadays it would have been amazing. Um, back in those days, to have a minute telephone conversation yes. with my mum was about $1.50 a minute wow. Australian. It was so expensive. So I used to buy those phone cards and some of you will remember, right? That makes it a lot cheaper, like half price or something. And I had a 20 or 30 minute call a month, you know, in, initially when, because, you know, when you're starting and you, you're just starting to get work and whatever, you know, the budget and that, or, and then it was a week, but it was that, it, and it was just a phone call. And so I had, because I had to call my mom and I had to call my dad, uh, do you know what I mean? So they, they were they're separated, they, they were divorced. So I had my allocated budget and time for to, to, to be in touch with both. And so now it's amazing that we do this and you can see each other and you can, it's just, and, and you could speak, I mean, on WhatsApp, I talked to my family for an hour and a half, to my sister, and then, but that was not possible back then. So um, obviously so much has changed. And this is something that just getting back into out of topic, but talking about perspective and what I love doing in, in mindset is, imagine if COVID had happened mm. when we didn't have that technology, right? the level of isolation, the, the level of disconnect. If it had to happen, it's, it's good that it happened now. Absolutely. Right? People could still see their families. I mean, my, my youngest sister had twin babies born right at the beginning of COVID. And even though, you know, my dad, they live in the same, in the same city, but he's a senior, vulnerable. And, you know, back when things started, he couldn't see him. So he said, to know that your daughter has had babies and you can't even be there or see them, but then she used to take the camera and have, you know, and show them the little video and, and you could be their life. So it's still a lot better than simply not being able to have that experience, right? I remember those days, you know, when you had to have those uh, 
calling cards. And whenever I traveled the first place, I would do after getting a SIM card is getting a calling card. Yes. Hey, I'm safe. I'm arrived, you know. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now it's so much easier. You just uh, message them on WhatsApp, on, on Facebook Messenger, and whatever video they can follow. You can even live stream it. They can follow you like be one of your fans. It's a different world. That's huh? right. Oh. Totally. And and it's only been a few decades, right? Like it's it's crazy. Oh, yeah. so Skype started in 2007. That really changed the game. It made calling international only for, for family, but also for business infinitely cheaper. And then back into yes. And then that's when WhatsApp started and Facebook and after that it's made I'm thinking yeah. that I can't imagine how better it's gonna get in the next few years. You know? Totally. Oh, so now yeah. let's move forward. Mm -hmm. From the time you left school to now, how would you describe your path? Would you say your path was pretty much straightforward, smooth sailing once you're into one lane, or was it more like turns and twists, like a roller coaster? Right. Um did I say I love variety? <laughs> so I, um, I actually, when I came to Australia, so I started using my, my admin skills and I worked in recruitment and I worked for um, one of the biggest rec recruitment firms and I loved it. It was very high pays, you know, good paying, good treatment. Um, and I had the opportunity to become a, a consultant but then I also realized that they were starting work at seven o'clock. They had appointments on Saturdays. You know, it, it, they wanted the big dollars. So therefore they worked really, really hard. And I said, is that the life that I want? And at that time, it didn't suit me. And, and even though I love, I love, um, so a good party and socializing and that aspect and that the high energy i think part of me like my heart always called to the to the helping so to speak uh service and what i ended up doing years later is i worked as an employment consultant but for the job network and the job network is um the system here that is this private companies but they contracted to the government to help the people that are on unemployment benefits. So most of them disadvantaged migrants, long-term unemployed, indigenous people, people like that, that need to get back into work. So I did that for in Sydney and, uh, and here when I came to, to WA, um, I did that for a number of years. And, and that was a different story, but that I think got me into the, the a little bit of the the training as well so uh, always been very big on um, building relationships so in that case i had to build relationships with employers um to you know one thing is to have a vacancy and to find the right person for it what we had to do there is we had the person that came with a fair bit of baggage and we had to try to find an employer that was open to to employ them and build that relationship to say hey but this person is reliable, has a good heart, he might just need retraining, or it's a mom that hasn't worked for 15 years because you know she was raising kids, she just needs an opportunity. So it it was very rewarding. And uh, I think that started to show sort of get into the relationship building in business, which I found something that it comes very natural to me. So something that I didn't mention when you talked about superpowers, that's probably it as well. Like to me, the level of connections applies to business also. Um, and so I did that for a number of years. And then interestingly, uh, my, I'm just going to have to tell the story. So my ex wrote a book, part of our travels would travel, wrote a book, ended up self-publishing. It's an inspirational story. And as a self-published, and you might know this, um, back then, you know, there was no Kindle and there was no, you know, so it was just paperback. If you, if you publish it, you had to pay for the printing job, for the everything, and then you had to find a way to distribute it and sell it, right? So it's upfront costs. But we eventually found a distributor here in Australia, it was a more independent one. So that I could get into well, the new age shops, the gift shops. And that was a market for that because the big, the big 
bookstore chains, they're always going to have their, you know, national buyers and that, so that you couldn't get in. It was too difficult. So anyway, what happened is that we had that, it was moving, it was a beautiful story, we had good feedback. And then um, in speaking with a distributor, because we thought, okay, well, we get more contracts, more languages, you know, like put it out there to publishers, but publishers don't take unsolicited manuscripts. So we asked the distributor, well, what, what do you like? How do you like what is a literary agent, right? Like, because these people would then say, and anyway, you say, well, what do you need as far as qualifications? And that I said, well, not really, you know, you just, you can just find that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, long story short, I became a literary agent. So, oh. so I pro promoted, so created, pitched, uh, da -da -da, and promoted the book. Oh, the manuscript and uh, and uh, got a few international contracts, kind of like did a lot of research and we worked together. Um, he was really good. He pushed me for that and, and just kind of like say, you know, he is very much a go getter. And then I ended up going to Frankfurt. I've been to the Frankfurt Book Fair wow. two, maybe three times on my own and making connections with publishers and that because then years later, my husband my now husband's uh, wrote as well some books on the same genre. So I approached the publishers and, and got some contracts as well. So I went back with him. So I've been a literary agent only for my husband's. That sounds really bad when I put it that way. <laughs> but I, just to sort of show that I wasn't, like well, I wasn't interested in doing that for a business. I did it because it was a good opportunity and also because I believed in the product. So then I found it easy to, to talk about it and, um, and then got contracts. So my husband now, um, Peter O'Connor has published, you know, so a couple of books and one in like seven or eight languages and we've got that. So I did, I did all that. So yeah, variety is the key, but I think in everything, when I start looking at it, everything permeates working with people, helping connections, and you know, speaking or advocating it, it's always part of it. So mm. it still follows the same thread, I suppose, to, to what I do now. And uh, and personally, yeah, my journey then then sort of um, was from from Sydney and New South Wales. Then I moved to the opposite side, um, Western Australia, where I hadn't been before because my husband and his family were here. So I said, if I'm all alone in Australia, and then um, we went to Perth for a couple of years. And then when, when I was expecting, then we came to the Southwest where his family was, because I said, well, let's not have a child with no one around when we have family a couple of hours away. So we kind of like came here and I live in a beautiful, it's called Bunbury. It's a coastal town, uh, mid-size, and it's only two hours drive to the city to Perth and uh, and an hour down south to Margo River, which is a region very well known as well, um, wineries and things like that. So it's kind of like the best of both worlds. Beautiful, close enough, we have the beach and, uh, and it's still fairly quiet and no traffic and things like that, which I enjoy now. We live in an acre, so I've got a lot of trees around and, wow. you know, wildlife. So yeah, when you said spiders, it, I do get sometimes big spiders like that, they get in the house. So I just catch them in a bottle and take them outside the garden. <laughs> yes, 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 can imagine. Wow, powerful. Now let's move forward because I know we can talk for forever. You have so many stories to share and I love stories. I'm all about stories in this podcast, all about stories. But now speaking of that, speaking of story, there is a, a saying, I'm sure you heard it, that says, change your story, change your, change your life. And by story, I mean what we tell ourselves on a, inside our head on a day-to-day -day basis. So when Absolutely. you- Absolutely. When you, Karen, when you were at the lowest, how did you do to change your story, to change your life? Did you use, was it through books, friends, family, relatives, uh, mentors? That was the process you used to change your story, to change your life. All right. So the very first time when I split up from my ex and um, I was in a, in a bad place just because I'd lost more than anything, I suppose, I had lost all my confidence, self-confidence. 
And um, what I what I say, you know, lost myself and lost my voice because I didn't quite know what I wanted. I used to go out for walks in nature and I always, to me, I'm, I'm a very auditory person. So I, I love the beauty of nature, um, but I was listening to either, you know, back in those days, um, there was no podcast, but that's the idea, you know, um, audios, recordings, videos, programs that I bought and, and some other things for free, just positive to kind of like shift that. And then I started to see sometimes when people are on their own, they can get down. And I say, you, it, it's a spiral, right? When you're on a downward spiral, it keeps going down. Now to shift that spiral, you look at a point and you say, okay, I'm not happy where I am. What can I do? Because you know that if you keep doing that, you're going to keep falling down, right? So mm. I'm not happy. So it's, it's enough. You know, it's enough. Now it's time to do something different. And so what can I do? And sometimes it's only the one little thing. Okay, I'm going to go for a walk because I find that inspiring and uplifting and I'm going to listen to something good. And then all of a sudden you start spiraling the other way because then I start, you know, you start eating healthy. I started going to the gym or I started walking or jogging or, you know, it, it, it all comes up. And then I decided to, okay, it's a time to reinvent myself. You know, what do I want? Who do I want to be? And I still wasn't very clear. So I, I thought I like people. So I, I enrolled in a hospitality certification just to have something. Cause all, all I had back then was secretary skills. And I didn't, I didn't want to stay in recruitment. Um, so I did the training. I enjoyed it. It had its own challenges. It kept me grounded because, uh, you know, I was kind of like for the first time going back to the, to the, um, I don't know, the college lifestyle because I lived in a tiny little one bed seater. I, I bought a bike because I couldn't afford a car and I was riding my bike to, you know, I was 29 and there was just 17 year olds in the class because I just kind of like went straight from school. But I didn't mind that. And anyway, so that started shifting. And, and I started working in that industry and meeting nice people. And even though I realized that that wasn't what I wanted to do long term, it was it was good and I got work and and eventually I, I met my husband and he kind of like my you know my my husband now husband um and then we kind of shifted cities and and I worked a little bit on that and that kind of like started leading on to when I decided to to get a, a better job that wasn't casual that wasn't uh, you know that, that wasn't just uh, part-time hours and, and late at night for hospitality. And then I went back into, okay, recruitment, but with that um, job network that I was mentioning, the government program. So I was able to use some of my skills, upskill a little, but then my heart was coming more into play. So I was able to now find something that was more aligned to, I really want to help people. So I work with migrants and I work with disadvantaged people and kind of like that got me, I think, in a path to, to everything has been leading. Because sometimes, and this is something that I want to share my help, sometimes we think that we've wasted time, right? I could have done this so much sooner. I could have started my business 10 years later. I should have left him five years ago. And, and yes, but everything is giving you an opportunity to learn totally. either about yourself or learn new skills. Sometimes you say you ended up doing this job that I didn't really like. It's like, what were the skills that you learned there that helped you get your next job or start your business or deal with a situation that came later? So you didn't know it then, but it's like I did my NLP certifications and I finished in November of 2019. And in February 2020, I was diagnosed with cancer. If I didn't have that mindset, I think that I would have dealt with it totally differently. Absolutely. Right? So 
why didn't I always wanted to, and I was always interested in personal development, but it just happened to those processes clear a lot of my negative emotions. I felt no anger. I felt no guilt. I felt no regret. I could have, you know, I could have blamed the doctors, the dad, myself for not having checked myself up earlier, but I didn't because I know, okay, this is where I'm at now. This is the reality. What can I do? But the way of looking at it that way only came because of the work that I'd done in myself the previous year. You know, I totally agree with that. Uh, that's also one thing that I learned the hard way, but important for me to learn is that life, there's no mistakes. You know, even if what we may consider from a human perspective, hey, this is a mistake, you, did the, you took the wrong action. It's not because you're going to learn tremendously from that. Even if you go, you made the wrong decision, the wrong path, so, for example, going to law school, you decided to go travel instead. From a more practical sense, it might seem that you made the wrong choice. But if you look at it from a spiritual perspective, there's no wrong choice because you will learn different sets of sets of you know wisdom from each from each uh, direction. But ultimately, you're gonna get there. You're gonna you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna you know graduate. And yes, I agree with you because. I went through something similar. You mentioned that when you were diagnosed with cancer, your spiritual awakening allowed you to, to handle that much better than if you were not, because that happened something very similar to me. As I said to you, when we spoke last time, I was, I was never religious, but I always believed in God. And when before the pandemic, I was living in Hong Kong in Asia, when the pandemic started, my father and my sister, my siblings started freaking out because I was next door to the, to the ground zero. So they asked me to come back home in Canada. I said, okay, I'm going to be here for a couple of months. Unbeknownst to me, I spent, I spent out two years. But that was a blessing in disguise because that allowed me to spend time with my father before he left us. My father left us last, last July because of cancer. And what really allowed me is that to overcome that and not go crazy and lose my mind is that during this pandemic, I've had my spiritual awakening. And this is what allowed me to really understand that, hey, life is much bigger than, you know, the so-called saying, YOLO, you have one life to live. I used to believe that, but now once I got introduced to, you know, spirituality and past lives and all that, say, so, well, that's that's BS, doesn't make any sense. You know, and once I understood that, I knew that hey, even if once this life is over, it's not the end. It's just one life and, and, a, and a multitude, endless succession of other lives. You're going to see the person again, we've been before together, just like at night when you sleep. In the morning, wake up. You have, you have a brand new day ahead of you. Same thing with this life. Once this mission is over, you get a new one. So that, when you said that, that really resonated with me. So thank you for sharing that. Beautiful, and uh, interesting when you just um, share about the, you know, the the path of the traveling or the studies or sometimes mm -hmm. something that that came to me um, is I remember a, a friend and she's um, a, a book coach. You know, so so. She doesn't pub. Oh, she, I'm not sure if she's published it, but her her big thing is about helping people write their books, okay, their stories. And she said she was a journalist, and so she traveled the world and done a lot of journalism and that, but wasn't happy with that sort of. Um, that wasn't fulfilling enough. And anyway, she lived in Australia and she went for holidays to visit Africa and she ended up visiting this tribe and she said that it was having that sort of um, ceremony that she was privy to be invited and asked the people there and what happened she said you know every elder tells the story of the village and every time somebody passes their story is added to the knowledge of yes. you know the elder so so it's it's you know, like we used to pass knowledge through generations. It was just storytelling. Uh, but they saw it that because that person's knowledge and story was still kept, then that person was still there, right? Mm -hmm. So she said, I just realized that that idea of building legacy, you know, the really passing that wisdom that really keeping those stories was so beautiful. So that, that's really what inspired her when she came back to Australia. Then she decided to help people write the stories. And she said she started working with um, um, elderly people um, to, to 
help them share the stories and the legacy and somewhere of war and somewhere of difficult times and you know but uh she found such a joy and she said to know that all that wisdom is not lost once they're gone you know it was so beautiful to be part of it and, and help help them so that it is still available for their collective so that wouldn't have happened if she hadn't gone on holiday to that place right that's, that's what I was getting at it's just sometimes yeah. you don't know yeah you don't know what you don't know it's going to be for a reason well, you just have to be open to it absolutely powerful now let's move forward let me let's talk now about uh, the beautiful impact you're having in the world let's talk about your business Sure. So I um, I started in 2020 when I was diagnosed with cancer, I decided that I wanted to begin coaching and I started as a mindset coach because I had the NLP uh, certifications. But I started working with women that were starting co- like starting coach, starter coaches. Mm-hmm. And I noticed that in as much as the limiting beliefs were holding them back and as something that I could help and I have processes to help clear that, then part of um, the what kept them um, stuck was they didn't feel they had the confidence to be on social media, to, to be present and to show up authentically because being heart-centered you want to be authentic right they didn't want to just give out this persona and they felt that they wanted to give their all and connect with the audience but there was still something there so that to me um, started to kind of like unravel the fact that there's so many that that want to find their voice and what is you know what is my authentic message and how do I now put it out there and present com- confidently or have the, um, the story to, the, the sorry, the confidence to share my story, which can be quite personal, you know, and, and to come live. And so all those things. So even though I was working on mindset, I was noticing that gap. And because I'm very passionate about speaking, then I thought, okay, and I took a public speaking course. So I did public speaking program with NLP and I found it it was very powerful. It could help me, but I found that there was still something missing. For me personally, I felt constrained being able to just make movements that were specific to the meaning that you wanted to convey and that sort of male dominated energy when you have to command the stage. and, And I said, I wanted to come and speak from a different place. So I came across a program called Women Speak and Women Speak was beautiful. That was designed especially for women and it's got a totally different energy and I learned some great embodiment practices and I started doing that for a while and offering that, facilitating that, so to speak, because a program exists and you have to just facilitate their program. And then I realized that that wasn't enough, that I had enough a broader knowledge that could better serve my clients because then I wanted to combine the mindset and the public speaking practices and the woman speak practices and create my own my own thing that could really offer much more than one of them alone and um, so that's something that I've just begun shifting this year and I've been working with other coaches to kind of like put together an offer that really serves the clients better. So I had my first group in January and I ran um, end of January and I ran six weeks and I ran, I love doing it with just small group. It was just five, five to six women so that you really have that opportunity to connect and to really go deep. And the beauty about that is that it's not, just that you learn to, you know, that that I can show you how to feel confident and and speak or push the button and go live, but to connect deeply within yourself so that what you're sharing comes from you rather than, you know, from up here, (laughs) from your head. And 
by doing that, just by having that small group, they all were able to kind of like discover each other. And sometimes, and I feel this may apply more to women, is that um, idea of women being there for everybody, right? We we give, we want to be good, we're good wives, good mothers, the kids, everything takes priority by ourselves. And then we lose part of ourselves, that which is, you know, was part of my story, that sort of self-confidence, whether it's from something from childhood or from just leaving our true self so far behind that we've forgotten. We've kind of like, you know, lost that connection, but it's still there. When you start um, bringing that out and the other women in the group would really feel it and connect and it's like, oh my gosh, like, that is such a powerful message. And it's almost like that, you know, I kind of was taken aback. It's like, really? Like, because there's still deep inside sometimes with, you know, a, a, there's a level where you feel like you're not good enough. And to have other people, you know, you're bouncing off ideas and, and other people sort of helping you realize that there is power in your story. You do have a beautiful message. You do have something to give. Mm. Um, I think... It's, it's really valuable. And that's what I like to do, the, the group component as well. And it builds that sort of camaraderie and everybody's supporting each other. Um, but I think for if any of, of, of your audience are, are coaches or entrepreneurs, I think sometimes we can get stuck too much in our head where we, you know, everybody says, so you've got to be an expert. And nobody starts an expert, right? Oh. But you got to start somewhere. So if you're just starting, don't worry about it. Because one thing that we fail to recognize is that I believe we all have something to teach mm -hmm. and something to learn. Because wherever you are, whatever you've learned from your story, or if you have some qualifications or some work experience, right, you have some knowledge and some insights that somebody would be like, Oh my goodness, I didn't realize. And for you, it's so natural. So that's what is important to keep in perspective. It's like, wherever you are, whatever you have, there is somebody that can benefit from your knowledge and from you putting it out there. And of course, the more you do it, the more you, sometimes, you know, the market, and, and the people that you deal with are going to kind of shift what you offer in the end because that's part of the journey, right? But at every point, you have something of value to give and your story has value. Because if you can even inspire one person to take the next step, or you can real help somebody see that, oh my goodness, there's hope at the end of the tunnel, like, you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel, there's hope that I can also overcome this. That is really, really powerful. Absolutely. And, and, yeah, and, and you don't have to make millions and, you know, you don't have to be famous to actually be able to have that level of impact. Absolutely, because what allows you to have an impact is to be able to speak, not from a script, not from uh, even words, but speak from the heart. If you can connect with a person as a human being, regardless of whether that person might be a PhD person or just some normal person with not much education, that doesn't matter, because he or she has tremendous life experiences that are very, you know, valuable to share. So we all have a message, we all have a story, we all have a, a gift to share with the world. And that can be the foundation of whatever impact you, you, you're trying to accomplish. So it doesn't have to, for you to be impactful and successful, you don't have to change the lives of all, every single living being in this planet. Even if you were to to, to have just 0.11% of 0.11% of that, there's plenty enough people for you to keep you happy and busy and fulfilled for the next 25 million lifetimes. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true. Uh, and that's something we forget that, you know, everybody wants to change the world, but the reality is that even that, I mean, Mother Teresa, started because she wanted to help that one person that she saw in the street right and then it was two people and then it was 10 and yeah 
And if you're so passionate and your mission is bigger than yourself because you're really about helping others, then this is the, the other part of the, the uh, that I'm passionate about um, sharing as well is then you can inspire people into your vision mm-hmm. because not everybody's going to be your client. Or, right? and that's okay. But yeah, but a collaboration, an interview, uh, uh, funding, you know, mm-hmm. it's all about how you communicate your vision and how passionate you are and when you when you have a vision vision that is beyond you that it's not it that that is actually impacting others and you are able to talk about it in a way that people can see that you really believe in it that you're really passionate about it they can buy into your idea and that's how you start making an impact bigger and bigger and bigger Absolutely, absolutely. Because not any single individual can change the world by themselves, no matter how powerful, how wealthy they may be. But each and every single one of us can do a little bit in our own circle of influence. And together we can create a global effect, just like you mentioned, uh, Mother Teresa, same thing for Gandhi and all the other people that have changed the world. It started with one person, one dream, powerful dream, inspired one person, and then it was a ripple effect around the world like a wave. So yes, yes powerful. Speaking of impact, Share with us, if you, if you will, if you may, an example of the most remarkable transformation you've seen from one of your clients so far. Wow. So something that I I noticed is there was a, a sometimes, and I don't know if, if you do that, but people that are in um, using social media to you know, get prospects on that, we do a little bit of searching. And sometimes you come across people that you think, okay, that might be good potential clients or something. I came across this um, lady and she was a coach in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that she had a a live video and she had so much good content because as an NLP coach, I knew that what she was sharing made sense. Like it was actually very informative, very, very good quality, but she had very limited um, comment like no comments and a couple of likes or something and I go because I noticed that it was just all like delivery in a lecture right Mm -hmm. it was all training and so I reached out to her and I said um look you know we're kind of connected and I said I'm running a group program I'd love for you to be there because you know how would you feel about and she said yeah I'm very nervous when I go live and I don't know if people you know like it and I said I think that what your what your delivery is missing is hard. So you gotta you gotta share your story. You gotta put some of you in it. And so she joined my program, and the whole thing shifted. And she said, "I didn't know it at the time." She said, "I've always lacked the confidence." She said, I've had opportunities to be a speaker before. I've been invited and I said yes. And the day before, I was actually pulling back and saying, so sorry, I'm sick or I I can't do it just because she couldn't face it. And now she said, I feel the greatest thing that's come out of it, not that just that I'm confident and I can do those practices before I go, you know, live or on stage is that. I feel that you've given me back my voice. Wow. And that's and that's so beautiful. And she said, incidentally, you know, I was talking, I was at doing my garden, and then my next door neighbor came and we started to ask me, what do you do for business? And to say, well, I'm a coach. And I said, and before I would have never spoken about what I do because I just didn't, I felt too self-conscious. And because I had that conversation, the gentleman said, or you must speak to my daughter because she's opening a spa and that, and she wants to have some coaches in the area. And so she got herself a venue to, to run her business from. Uh, and a, just a really good partnership, just because she had the confidence to start speaking about herself, what she does and her mission. Yeah. Powerful. Beautiful example. Thank you for sharing. Now, Let's talk about something that is dear to my heart and I'm sure to your heart as well. Let's talk about causes. What would you say is a cause for you that is very dear to your heart? Mm. 
I, uh, you mean as in normal charities or in general? It doesn't have to be charity, a cause that you really resonate with, that is dear to your heart and that you would, that you're passionate about, that you love contributing and helping. But contributing, I don't mean not necessarily money, but in terms of sometimes it can be just yeah. offering leadership, guidance, mentorship, whatever way that, you, that you're helping or contributing or just passionate about the cause. Gotcha. Um, so it's interesting because I feel nowadays there's, there's so much that can be done. Mm-hmm. In, in so many in so many different areas you know we're like very passionate about helping the children and sometimes i've been involved with like world vision or some of those type of projects um because i also see the the resemblance with um peru you know some of those communities with very limited very limited income um and things like that so ultimately i would love to for me to be able to to go back to peru and have the resources to, to help a community of women, to help them to, to find their voice, to have that strength so that they can um, also find a, a, a better way if, you know, if their circumstances are not ideal, well, what can I do differently? Because there's this, um, sometimes we get stuck on the problem and talking about the problem is not going to help us find solutions. So, but just that needs a different level of awareness. But the other thing that I that I love um, with with what exists now, I mean, I honestly, I sometimes change who I support. I support some some organization for a number of years because I feel that there is so much that I like to do that I can. So I've, you know, I've supported um, the children for a number of years, and then I'll do some of that. Over here in Australia, there's the Fred Hollows Foundation. They're very, um, this is incredible. There's so many people that lose their vision in, in third world countries because of glaucoma and, and very, very preventable. So they do surgeries so that those people can see again. And those stories are incredible because to, you know, had a, a father that for the first time was able to see a child uh, because, you know, lost the vision when the, the boy was a baby or that, you know, a little thing and, and um, can have sometimes such a huge impact. So I think that's probably my better answer is that I don't have just the one cause. Um, I'm compelled to to help where and when I can. I'm sure on that we're on the same page. If I could and if you could, we would help every single cause on the, on the face of this planet. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. Now, listen, we can talk for hours. It's been an hour and a half to just flew like this. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm we're going to talk about your battle against cancer, that can be an entire episode by itself. Some of the talking about your incredible uh, travels and juicy stories, anecdotes from those. I mean, we definitely need to do a part two in the next few weeks. For now, let's nice. start wrapping things up. And to, to finish it off, I'd like to ask you a series of, again, rapid fire questions, but this time on advices. Ready? No. Oh, okay, go for it. All right, Karen. So tell us, what has been so far the best piece of advice you've received in your life? that you have to give people what they need first, mm. not what you, so, sorry. You have to give people first what they want, not what you think they need. We have That's a- very subtle, very subtle different because you would eventually might be able to give them what they need, but you have to give them what they want first because they have to receive things in their terms yeah, yes. for it to be of value to them. Yeah. Love that. And on the flip side, what has been so far the worst piece of advice you've received in your life other than a job? No, uh, yeah, coaches that are pushing the sales to just get people to commit because buy this program and, you know, if you have to borrow, go borrow. Go uh, uh, Like how can you get somebody to Not get on a, a loan for and they're promising results that they really can't guarantee. 
That's so how they make, they make the that's money. just to me it's so unethical. You know, they make the money by selling the dream, not by actually doing it. And these are the worst type of, yeah. I can't even call them coaches, because a real coach would never do that. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Now, imagine that if you were blessed with a time machine, you can go back in time and sit face to face with an 18-year-old Karen. What's the number one piece of advice you would give to her knowing all that you know now? Don't lose yourself. Oh, powerful. Love that. Yeah. Now, do you have your own podcast yet? No. I've, um, I, I love, I've been on many interviews and I've interviewed some people on my Facebook, um, well, Zoom Facebook, but not on our podcast channel. All right. What's uh-huh. another one reason that you don't have your podcast yet? I think part of it is thinking that the 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 setup, the technology, the you know, that'll be difficult. I'm definitely not a very technical person. Yes, that's one of the but, top. Yes, from my experience so far. Yes. Now imagine that you had a that that you had a podcast today and it was very successful. And today you're interviewing the most special person in the world, which is yourself. What is the first question that you want to ask yourself? Don't think too much. What is the first question that comes to your mind? What is the best advice that you can give somebody? That would be my very first question. What's your answer? And goodness, I may put myself on the spot right there. I think that, yeah, trust yourself and learn, but always come back to you. Find what works for you. Look within, not outside. Absolutely. Yes. Beautiful. Now, the last question I want to ask you, and that's my favorite question. What is the smallest thing that you've done in your life that has had the greatest positive impact in both your life and business? And by small, I don't mean something small. I mean the one thing. For example, for me, it's been my podcast. What about you, Karen? I think for me, um, probably the woman speak. Mm. Because it helped me realize that that. I needed to reconnect with my my feminine energy that we need to it's it's okay to express emotions when you speak and it's okay to use your whole body as an experience when you talk you know it's not about this is placate and that is this and you know like politicians I never wanted to speak like that so to actually know that you can be fully expressive and still have the impact that you want and actually i believe you get greater impact beautiful beautiful love that now if someone wants to connect with you what's the best way to do so yes i'm more active on facebook uh and i if if you have um the description i would love to give you the link because there's quite a few karen o'connors on facebook (laughs) unfortunately Um, so otherwise my group which is um, speaking authentically that would be that would be the best way and if anybody is interested I'm actually uh, having a a confidence and visibility is my my entry sort of short program I I run a confidence and visibility challenge um, to, to be confident to be on live, uh, to present better. And if somebody wants to know the details, um, they can just send me a DM because I kind of like do different dates and different times to cater for the different time zones. One so more. I haven't got a specific, um, you know, time and, and details yet. It's best to just, yeah, like last time, you know, I can cater more for US or I can cater more for um, Europe, Australia, depending on, the majority of the group so your website i do but i keep for now i keep it personal okay no worries listen karen absolute pleasure talking to you uh the hour and a half just flew by we definitely have to bring it back because as i said there's so many more things we haven't even touched yet i salute you you're truly with art keep shining your light keep blessing the world with your presence with your impact with your smile with all the good things you're doing out there stay safe stay awesome god bless you my friend we're definitely going to be talking soon very fast again take care
Thank you so much, Feynman. And truly, it's been a pleasure being here. And um, yeah, you are an amazing and welcoming host. So love the experience as well. Thank you. Have a wonderful day for you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.